case on this morning's docket. That is case number 111166, State of Kansas v. Antonio Brown, Sr. May it please the court, Peter Meharry for Antonio Brown. I have to have three minutes of my time for rebuttal, Your Honor. Three minutes is granted. Thank you. In this case, Mr. Brown was charged and convicted of one count of felony murder, along with two counts of child abuse and one count of interference with a law enforcement officer. The facts stem from the death of a toddler on or back in October of 2011. My client contacted his girlfriend at the time, a Brittany, I think it's Betzold, and indicated that he was home with her toddler and he was not acting right. She came home from work. Clearly there were issues with the toddler. My client proceeded to go out, get some Pedialyte and a bath stopper as they were going to plan on giving the toddler a cold bath. While Brittany was home with the toddler, she became more concerned and eventually called 911. The toddler was taken to Salina Regional Hospital. Due to the severity of the injuries, the toddler was then taken to Wichita. The toddler eventually passed away from multiple injuries. I believe the cause of death was determined to be blunt force trauma. From that, my client was charged with felony murder based upon the child abuse. The two child abuse charges covered different time periods. The one covered the day of the death and the second one covered the week leading up to the death. He was sentenced to life with a minimum of 20 years incarceration plus 194 months for the child abuse charges and the interference charge. The 194 months represents an upward departure. It was found by the jury multiple factors to support an upward departure and the district court found that those factors were substantial and compelling. It sentenced my client essentially to double-double rule with the child abuse charges. In this case, we have raised several issues and what I'd like to do is essentially start with issue one and move forward from there. Issue one does deal with the suppression issue. Before trial, or I should say after my client's arrest, he was interrogated by the police. That was videotaped and that was eventually played for the jury. Prior to trial, counsel for Mr. Brown filed a motion to suppress those statements. The district court found that they were properly admissible. We take a few issues with the findings of the district court as to the admissibility of those statements. We believe that they were obtained in violation of my client's constitutional rights. There are essentially three parts to our argument. I'd like to focus on the first part of the issue and that is after my client asked and attempted to contact his attorney, Mr. Struble, whether or not my client re-engaged or re-initiated contact with the police or whether or not the police officers made comments or statements to elicit a response on behalf of my client to keep him talking. It's our position that the police officers did make statements, particularly the statement that they were, quote, something to the effect that we're just trying to figure this thing out. That comment was made after my client had been unable to get a hold of Mr. Struble. But it was also made after your client was talking a little bit. So it's not like the officers engaged him. He engaged. I guess I would characterize it differently. I know that my client did make some comments, but I don't think it was of the nature to engage the officers. And I think the officers really took it one step further with their comments about trying to figure this thing out. And I think that was an attempt by the officers in this case to keep my client talking without an attorney. Let's go through it and tell me where the trigger was pulled, okay? So 
He asked to be able to contact a lawyer that had been representing him in another case. The officers arranged for him to have a phone, and they got him the phone numbers, and he made two attempts at two different numbers to call counsel, correct? Correct, yes, sir. And so then the investigator says, no answer, and your client says no. Nothing wrong there. Correct. The investigator then uses the word well, gets interrupted, and your client says, I understand what's going on. You know what I'm saying? I understand fully what's going on. The investigator, so trigger pulled there? I think the trigger comes when the investigator then says, it's our goal to figure out. But a couple of other things happened before that. The investigator then says, right, okay, and then Brown says, you know I mean this. Then he gets interrupted by the investigator saying, our goal is to figure out the situation. Your client then says, yeah, I'll talk. The investigator says, without the presence of attorneys, and your client says, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Like I said, I have nothing to hide. Then the investigator says, okay. So your point here, your argument hinges on making it improper for the investigator to say, our goal is to figure out the situation. I believe that that statement is improper and is an attempt by the officers to get my client to talk. What was the officer supposed to do, given the fact that your client is talking, is engaging in some kind of conversation? I think what the officer needs to do is ask my client point blank, are you waiving your rights? Are you prepared to talk without the presence of an attorney? Isn't that what he did, investigator number one, without the presence of attorneys? And your client says, yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Like I said, I have nothing to hide. And that was after the investigator said, we're just trying to figure this thing out. And I think that comment is looking to elicit a response by my client. And it did. And what case law would you rely on that that was the trigger point? The case law is out there that this court and other courts talk about. If officers make comments that are geared toward eliciting a response, that is still a violation of my client's rights, even if my client does respond. And I would also point to the case law out there that this court has said and other courts as well, that we are to scrupulously honor these rights, to protect these rights. And if we're going to scrupulously honor those, I think the officers need to clarify and say before they make comments looking for a response, to say, are you proceeding, waiving your right and prepared to proceed without an attorney? And they didn't do that in this case. So I think the officer's actions were looking to keep my client talking. And they succeeded. And it's those comments. Isn't that comment itself ambiguous? Our goal is to figure out the situation. I mean, you're reading it, I think, to say they're wanting to talk to him, you know, that we're wanting to question you. Could it equally be understood to be we're just trying to figure out what you're wanting to do here? Are you wanting to talk to your attorney or are you wanting to talk to us? Because he's already said, I fully understand what's going on. I don't see the comments that way, Your Honor. I understand that you're arguing it the other way. But if there is ambiguity, what do we do with that? I think as far as ambiguity, I think you should err on the side of caution and protect my client's rights. And if the officer is creating ambiguity, I don't think he should be able to hide behind that. So if he is trying to figure out if my client wants to go forward without an attorney, he should say, do you want to go forward without an attorney? Not if this court finds that this is kind of an ambiguous statement. That should not be used as essentially a safety net for the officer. Again, we talk about scrupulously honoring this right. But yet when we seem to have some ambiguity, we don't seem to care about the right. And I think to protect it properly, the officer needed to be clear. And if he wasn't, and frankly, I think the statement was to get my client to talk. But if he wasn't clear, he shouldn't be able to hide behind the ambiguity that he created. And to follow up on Justice Biles' earlier question, what would be your best case 
that would be factually similar or even identical to this that you can point us toward where we would say, yes, that is an ambiguity and it should be construed in your client's favor? I don't know that I have a case uh, that I can give the court right now that is factually similar as far as statements being made. Um, again, I fall back on the case that talks about uh, where officers are making comments, are making statements that are looking to elicit responses. Um, and there are cases certainly out there, we've cited some in our uh, brief, uh, that when they do that, um, that is a violation of my client's rights. Well, we have U.S. Supreme Court cases uh, that say when the suspect invokes his right to counsel during questioning, the interview must end. Correct. And it doesn't say must end uh, 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 unless the police can ask something ambiguous to get it to get the defendant to unwaive uh, or, or rewaive uh, his or her rights. And I think, you know, when you look at the district court's ruling, I think it did see an unambiguous request here. Because the district court uh, noted that once my client uh, stated he wanted to contact Mr. Shrubel, uh, the district court noted that the questioning ended. Um, so I think we do have a clear request. Um, and when my client was unable to get a hold of his attorney, it was the officers who made statements that essentially kept my client talking. But, but the real question here, I think, is whether he reinitiated. Uh, your client can talk further. Sure. The officers have to end the interrogation, but he can... Uh, Reinstitute the conversation. And Certainly, that, my that's client. That's a real question here. That it, there's uh, uh, certainly a, uh, an interpretation here of, of his statements indicating he, well, not even an interpretation. He said, I want to continue to talk. And I, I would argue that that was after the comments by the police. Um, you know, I don't think there's a clear indication after he was unable to get a hold of his attorney that he wanted to continue to talk until the officer said, hey, we're just trying to figure this thing out. Well, he actually had said before the attempt to reach out to the attorney over the telephone, he said, actually, it doesn't matter because I have nothing to hide. I want to clarify a couple of things. Um, I mean, so he's already indicated before the lawyer contact that he's willing to talk and it doesn't matter if he makes the contact. He, but he'd feel better if he tried, so they tried. I think. I mean, I think you have to take the whole thing in context. And I would argue that he clearly wanted to get a hold of his attorney. And they he let called, him. And they let him, absolutely. Uh, and he tried two different numbers and was unsuccessful. I think that's uh, as clear an invocation as you can get. Let me I want to talk to my lawyer. Can I call my lawyer? And I tried to call my lawyer. So I think that's a clear invocation, and then the question is whether or not who re-engaged. Let me, let me ask you, there's, in the district court's ruling on this, there's a statement that's, that where the said, and the court finds that the defendant did not make an unequivocal request for counsel. What do we make of that sentence, given the fact that they're, both of you, the state and the defendant, claim there was a, an unequivocal request, you can read the transcript and see there was. They even gave him a phone and a phone and a couple of phone numbers. So is that is the the district court just misstating there, and we look past it, or is this an error of law in the court's analysis? Uh, I think I think it's an error by the court to, for that finding, um, because I think there clearly was an invocation of his rights, uh, an attempt to contact an attorney. Um, I think. To say otherwise isn't supported by the, the record um, as far as the video or the testimony that was at the suppression hearing. Um, so I think this court, uh, looking at that finding by the district court, should essentially find that it was incorrect. Was it a finding that made a difference? Was there any other basis? Was, did the trial court also rule that he reinitiated? The trial court did state that it found my client reinitiated contact. So if in fact um, so that was also a finding... Um, or a conclusion, and we can argue about which. If that was also said, then what difference does it make? Whether there was a clear invocation, because you, it assumes a clear invocation and then moves right. on in the analysis, doesn't it? As far as our arguments go, um, I don't think that finding is 
the finding that there was no clear invocation uh, is critical. I think the more important finding is whether or not or who re-engaged. Um, and, and again, we think the court, district court was incorrect to find that my client was the one that did so. And what type of determination is that? Is that a factual finding or is that a legal conclusion that your client initiated the conversation after he could not get a hold of his lawyer? That's probably a factual finding based upon the video and the testimony at the motion to suppress hearing. Um, I just don't believe it's supported um, based upon the video and the testimony at the suppression hearing. If there are no other questions, I see my time is up. Any further questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. May it please the court. Um, I may have given the wrong impression that in my briefing, um, it is the state's position that the defendant didn't make an unequivocal request for counsel, but even if he did make an unequivocal request, we address the argument from that perspective. And How do you give police the idea that you want counsel uh, uh, more clearly than calling uh, well, the attorney? I mean... I don't understand how, how that's equivocal. You uh, have to take it in context with everything. And I believe Antonio Brown stated, he had a, I have a lawyer on a prior case. I don't know if he's still my lawyer. Let me call my roommate. He's paying for my financial fees. I'm going to have my roommate get a hold of my attorney just to see if I should have him here or not. Um, and so I think there could be some argument on both sides of that. And that's why the, in the state's brief, we didn't focus completely on that because we thought, okay, even if, the, if people could disagree whether or not that was an unequivocal request for counsel, the state felt in the end the fact that the defendant reinitiated contact, um, then um, we wouldn't really have to address that argument. Um, it was easier to address the, the second half than the first. And I, and I didn't want to leave you with the impression that the state disagreed with the findings of the court. Um, what does it take to reinitiate? Well, in does this case... Does it take a clear statement that I am willing to talk to you? And, and, and it may be different in other cases, but I think in this case it is very clear. Hey, I'm still going to talk to you. Actually, it doesn't matter. I, don't, I have nothing to hide. Uh, the investigator says you're going to talk without the presence of an attorney. Um, but and the very there, first statement is, I understand what's going on. You know what I'm saying. I understand fully what's going on. Why is that nothing more than a reiteration that I understand my Miranda rights? Why, why is that a statement that's uh, sufficient to allow the investigator to reply with, our goal here is to figure out the situation? Well, I think it is a sufficient statement that the defendant, it could be found to be a sufficient statement that the defendant was uh, understanding his rights and, and waiving them. Um, the Where's defendant, the waiver? That's the question. Pardon? Where's the waiver in that? Well, I believe um, when he says, I understand what's going on, and he still says, I understand that um, I'm going, you know, when he's saying, I'm going to talk. But that's later. Uh, I have nothing to hide. That's later. That's after this statement that the defense is focused on about the goal of the situation. In this case is very different than in a lot of cases. This defendant was chatty. He talked almost nonstop. And I, I think if you look at the entire interview, that's the case. The officers here did very little interviewing in this case. This defendant pretty much ran with the interview. And I think his statements there are evidence as well that he understood what was going on. He wanted to talk. And clearly, he talked. Um, he he did the majority of the talking. The officer just pretty much sat and listened in this case, and I think that's indicative of the defendant's personality here. And um, I think the um, in the state's position is that he clearly reinitiated that contact and wanted to talk. He never once said anything to the contrary. The officers gave him the phone book. They gave he couldn't find numbers in the phone book. They told him. They found the numbers for him, two separate numbers. Uh, they helped him dial out because you have, on a city phone, you have to be able to dial a sequence of numbers to dial out to a line. 
they helped him with all of that. This is not a case where the police were coercive or threatening or abusive. If you look at the entire interview, uh, it is the defendant in this case that um, does most of the talking. I don't believe that the officers, when they said we're just trying to figure out what happened, said that um, with a design to elicit a response from the defendant. And that's the state's position in this. Do I correctly read your briefs that on this issue that if we disagree with you uh, about whether the defendant reinitiated that you make no argument about whether that was a harmless error? That's correct. Um, that's correct. Can I focus you on the <laughs> interference factors. with the police? I'm sorry, oh. the interference with the police officer charge. Yes. Can Can you explain to me what this guy supposedly did to to uh, commit a crime by just hiding in a basement? It is the state's position that he um, well he fled from the scene. He ran to this home, and he hid in the basement. The police came. They instructed him. They knew he was in there. Um, he was, the tenants of the home told him, told the police that he was in the basement hiding. Uh, they went down. He was a suspect in a murder case. What official and duty was interfered with? Their ability to uh, arrest him, to take him into custody. Um, was there a warrant out for him? There arrest? was not. Okay. He hid from them when they went to the stairs. He... Uh, they directed anyone there to come out. He, re he did not come out. Um, so I guess it's by omission there, failing to follow the direct orders of the officers. There was someone on the couch who jumped up and fled. Um, but what's, left. The, what's the official duty that he, that, he, that he interfered with here? That's what I'm trying to get at. Their, Their investigation? Investigation taking him into custody. Would he be in violation of the statute if he exercised his right to remain silent? No. What's the difference? He was directed to, uh, he wasn't directed to talk or speak. He was directed to come up out of the basement to present himself. He hid from them. Okay. And it's delayed the investigation by what? A minute? Two minutes? My understanding no. is the occupant of the dwelling knew he was down there and said he's down there hiding and it actually That's, uh, referred them to a specific place where he was. So they go down there and they move a couple of things and see him. Isn't that what Not exactly. It was a little longer than that. In fact, they went down, they instructed him to present himself. He failed to do so. It wasn't until they called for a canine uh, that he decided to present himself. And uh, the officers did go down there. Multiple, More than one officer came to back up. They went down and, um, and looked for him, searched for him. They weren't able to access the area where he was. I believe it was a crawl space in the basement that... And then there was items of, of household items around him um, as well, so that they were unable to see him and they were un unable to access him. But he did come out when the dog was called. And this is, dog was as Justice Biles pointed out, there's no warrant for That's his correct. arrest. So a citizen has a, a duty to show themselves when, when a state officer says, appear? Correct in violation of, of some sort of obstruction or of, of official duty. Or Correct. Duty. Okay. Do you have there's any cases actually, that say that? Well, there's actually a city <laughs> ordinance in Salina to that effect, I believe, as well. But um, Was he charged under the city ordinance? No, under state law. Correct. So just back to my question, is there any case law from this court or lower courts that says exactly what Justice Rosen just asked, that absent any of these other circumstances, i.e. a warrant, a citizen has an obligation to show themselves just upon the instruction of a law enforcement officer when they're in their own home. It, it's sort of a passive resistance of arrest. Um, I know there's a Hatfield case from many years ago that, that I don't think either one of us cited in our briefs that... Um, might play into what you all seem to be questioning me about as well that I looked at again last night. But um, 
I'm just trying to understand that we have a requirement that in order to arrest someone in their own home, you have to have a warrant, right? Not cor correct. He wasn't in his own home. Okay, so he was in someone else's home. He, he so ran to a friend. He, I mean, you can't just go into someone. I, I just am trying to follow this. So what kind of the, lawful life my colleague is asking. The tenants gave them permission to enter the residence. Not initially, okay. but at some point. Um, permission to enter. The sisters gave permission to enter. Okay. And said, at first they were saying, to, you know, don't talk to the police, don't tell them. And then eventually they did consent to the, the entry and said he's down in the basement hiding. And, and so they went down into the basement. Okay. Were Thank they charged with obstruction also? No. Okay. I believe they testified. In the Hatfield case, the officer was trying to serve a protective order. Correct. And that's not comparable in this it, case. And... It's also not, it's a little bit different also, I suppose, in that the, um, the mother showed up, the, the doors were locked and the law enforcement was unable to make entry. The mother showed up um, after the police were there and she just stood outside. She's not the one that locked the door. She didn't take any action. She just stood there. In this case, Antonio Brown took some affirmative action. He went and hid and, and covered up. So I guess it's a little different um, than um, Hatfield I think the in that distinction sense. here is that the officer was trying to serve a court order in Hatfield and really were just at the investigatory stage of what your, your officers were up to. I think they were looking to take him into custody. I believe um, the child had, was deceased at that point and uh, he had been the caretaker of that child and um, when you looked at this child, it was pretty clear that this child had been physically abused. I mean, I know you couldn't see the internal injuries, but if you, when you look at the pictures, particularly of this child's buttocks and, and, and all the bruises on, it was pretty clear that this was going to be a felony murder case. Let me take you over to the upward departure. Could, could I ask a question <laughs> on this issue yet? Uh, would it make any difference in terms of the uh, the category in which this person fits. For example, if the police had come to the home and asked the homeowner, where is he? Is he here? And they were uh, not helpful. They could have been could, silent. They could have, I'm sorry? They wouldn't have to respond. I mean, I don't think they have any obligation to. They would not be charged with hindering the police because they're not cooperating in letting the police know if this individual is hiding there or present. Is that what you're saying? If they didn't say, come in, we'll hide you. Um, I mean, if they hid the individual themselves, they could be potentially charged with obstruction. Um, but the fact that they're just standing there, no. If they would have walked home and not known he was there, he was a frequent guest at their home, they didn't um, know if he was inside or no, not. I mean, if they voluntarily let him in because he said, I need to hide from the police, and the police made some inquiry of the homeowner, do you know where he is or is he here? And they said no. Is, is, that, a, is that a crime in your I, view? The way you restated or stated the facts at that time when they intentionally mislead the police by saying no, that's a different situation than than not responding. But I think when you make an affirmative statement, there he's not in the house. I don't we haven't seen him. Um, that's different than remaining silent. In my humble opinion. I did so, want to talk about the upward departures before the, we get you uh, out of time. Um, so, as I understand it, you submitted three aggravating factors on count two, which were the injuries for the date of death. That was the underlying child abuse for the felony murder. Correct. And then count four, you had four aggravating factors. We added excessive brutality, is my recollection. And Excessive brutality, I think, was the was the Correct. difference. And as I read the district court's order in imposing the upward departure, it used all four factors for both counts. Is that the way you read it? I don't recall, but... Um, it's clear that excessive brutality was not 
applicable to count two, which That's is correct. Uh, October fourth, fourth day, the death, the date of death. So we can't consider that one. That's correct. Okay. Um, the um, I believe that there's enough um, evidence to support the findings on the others, so, though, um, that the upward departure can still be upheld. Any other questions? Thank Is you. It, I'm just going to say that concludes your presentation, Council. Yes. Okay. Any further questions? Thank you. Thanks. Council, where does it leave us if the state has not made a harmlessness argument? Well, I would argue that um, if this court finds that there was an error as far as the admission of the statements, then it would require reversal. Um, the state has not said that the admission is harmless. Um, and we certainly have argued in our brief that the admission of those statements were pretty harmful. Um, so I think that this court, if it finds error in the admission, uh, would need to reverse this matter for a new trial. I didn't have anything else to really add unless there were other questions from the court. Any more questions? I see none. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you both for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement.